Today I want to share with you the top seven must-have meal extenders for your prepper pantry. Plus, I'm going to show you how to use some of those meal extenders to make a dinner to feed a crowd for about five dollars in total. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now the first thing I want to mention is be sure to open the description underneath this video where I'll have timestamps listing everything I'm going to cover so if any time you want to jump ahead it's easy to do. And the reason I always like to include timestamps whenever I do a video about the prepper pantry is I always like to take a few minutes in the beginning to talk to the beginner. Whenever I use the general term pantry, I'm referring to the four corners pantry. And what that means is the four places where we store food in our house. The first corner is our working pantry, something we access every day where we store non-perishable foods. The second corner is our refrigerator, the third corner is our freezer, and the fourth corner is our extended pantry or prepper pantry. And the prepper pantry is where we store our backup non-perishable foods that we use to restock our working pantry when our supplies run low. And if you've not yet created a prepper pantry, I have a very extensive playlist all about the process to go through to make it very easy for you. Why we need a prepper pantry, how to stock your prepper pantry with real food, nothing fancy, all things you can easily buy at the grocery store, and how to do it for no more than about $5 a week added to your grocery budget. Plus, that playlist also includes all the best ways to store your food to extend its shelf life. So I'll be sure to link to that playlist in the iCards and in the description below, as well as the pinned comment, because I know that's easier for some of you to access. So today in this video, we're basically focusing on our working pantry and our prepper pantry and how we can stock these two corners of our four corners pantry with non-perishable foods that are meal extenders. Now, what do I mean when I use the term meal extender? A meal extender is something that you can add to whatever you're making to reduce the cost but increase the amount of the meal. And the good news is all of these meal extenders are very simple foods that you can find at pretty much any grocery store. Now why do we want to stock meal extenders? And the reason is grocery prices seem to be rising almost every day. So in order to stay within our grocery budgets, we need to find ways to stretch our meals, to extend our meals. Basically by cutting the amount of the more expensive items we use and mixing those with less expensive items. So we're still presenting a nutritious and delicious meal, but one in which we've lowered the overall price, but not the overall quantity. The first meal extender that you want to keep stocked in your working pantry and your prepper pantry are beans. Now I stock both canned beans as well as dried beans, but I highly recommend making sure that you have some canned beans on hand because although dried beans are a lot less expensive, the good news is with canned beans, when you're in a rush and you want to quickly make a meal and you want to extend it, you want to make it affordable and you want to increase the amount of food that you're making, having beans that are already in the can, ready to add to your meal, makes life very easy. Now when it comes to dried beans, I stock all kinds of beans. And if you're thinking, oh my goodness, beans don't always agree with me, I have a video where I show you the right way to cook beans, which involves a long soaking process. And if you want to take it even one step further, you can sprout your beans. And by soaking and sprouting them, you make them incredibly digestible. However, that does require some time. And so you have to know that if you're planning on using some dried beans to cook with, you've got to give yourself a few days of advance notice. But I'll be sure to link to those videos, the one on soaking and on sprouting, if that's something you'd like to learn more about. But when it comes to adding beans to any recipe, 
Canned beans are just so simple and they're perfect when you run a busy household. Now I especially like to keep any kind of white bean. I've got a cannellini here and I think yeah, I've got the Great Northern here. Navy beans are wonderful also. And I also like to keep red kidney beans. I like the dark red kidney beans. Any of these can be mashed and mixed with chopped meat or ground beef as it's also called to extend the amount of meat. So you can take a half a pound of ground beef and a can of beans, mash them up, mix everything together. You can make hamburgers, you can make meatballs, you can use that as your filling in lasagna. There's a lot of things you can do and nobody's going to notice that you added beans. And beans are considerably less expensive than meat. So not only have you saved money, you've stretched that meal because you've only used a half a pound of your ground beef and you can save that other half a pound to use for another meal. So out of one pound of ground beef, you can get two meals for considerably less than if you had used that whole pound of ground beef right from the beginning. And white beans work very well with meat and so do red kidney beans. And beans are very good for also extending soups and stews. So if say you make a chicken soup or a chicken stew, you can pull way back on the amount of chicken that you use and just add some type of white bean in place of the additional chicken. So if you normally use two cups of chicken to make a chicken soup or a chicken stew, pull that back to one cup of chicken and then add a can of white beans. It'll make it very filling and very hearty and no one's going to miss the fact that you pulled back that chicken. And never worry that you're not going to have enough protein in the meal. You know, especially if you're feeding children or teenagers and you want to make sure that they're going to get enough protein, they definitely will, especially if you make your super stew in the way that I'm going to share with you. Keep in mind that one cup of chicken has a lot of protein in it, plus the beans have a lot of protein in them. But if you make your super stew with bone broth, all the better. Bone broth is very rich in protein, plus it's what's known as a protein sparer. And what that means is that the bone broth helps your body absorb every little last bit of protein from any other protein in the meal. So you're going to maximize the absorption from the chicken that you're eating and you're also going to maximize the absorption of the protein from the beans that you're eating. So there's many ways to extend a meal and get the most out of the groceries that you're using to make your meal and yet at the same time to make it very nutritious and delicious. Now two things that I want to mention. The first is that I will have a corresponding blog post that will go along with this video. And if you open the description underneath this video, you'll see the link that will take you over to my website. And in that blog post, I'll share a lot more ideas on how to use beans as a meal extender. And in that blog post, I'll also cover lots of ideas for how to use all the meal extenders that we're going to cover in this video. The other thing I want to mention, you may notice I'm not brand loyal. I buy pretty much anything that's either the store brand or on sale or something that I have a coupon for. And I highly recommend that you do the same. Because during times like this when grocery prices seem to be spiraling out of control, we always want to try to get the best buys we can and stay within our budget. Meal extender number two, lentils. Now I love all kinds of lentils and I love to make lentil soup. I like to make lentil salads. I can always find ways to use lentils. But when it comes to having them as a meal extender, your best lentils are going to be these simple brown lentils. Now sometimes you may see them referred to as green lentils, but either way they're the, just the plain common lentil that is most often seen at the grocery store. And the reason these lentils are so wonderful to keep on hand is they work beautifully when mixed with meat. You can certainly add them to a soup or a stew where you're adding in some bits of meat, but they work really well when mixed with chopped meat or ground beef. You'll just cook them up and they cook up very quickly and then you'll mash them, not unlike the beans, and mix them with your ground beef and then proceed with your recipe. Nobody's going to know there's lentils in there. 
And lentils are extremely affordable. They're much less expensive than meat. A one pound bag of lentils, especially if you can find your store brand as opposed to a name brand, may often run you a dollar or less. It can't be beat. And the nice thing about lentils is they're generally easy to digest. Now, if you find beans difficult to digest, no matter what you do, even if you soak and sprout them and you still find them difficult to digest, so you're hesitant to use them as a meal extender, then lentils are your best friend. These cook up quickly, they're easy to digest, and they work beautifully as a meal extender. Now, what I've got here are dried lentils. And the reason is they have a wonderful shelf life and they cook up quickly. But you can also buy canned lentils. And I often see them at Walmart and I believe they're under a dollar a can. So that's another good buy. And the nice thing about lentils, given that they are easy to digest, if you like to do a once a week meatless meal, like meatless Mondays, then lentils are wonderful because you can make a hearty lentil soup in the winter and in the spring and summer, you can make lentil salads. And a big pot of lentil soup is really a bargain because you could use this entire bag of lentils, throw in some chopped carrots, some chopped onions, maybe some greens, all relatively inexpensive vegetables, and keep the cost of your lentil soup quite low. And from this one pound bag of lentils, you could probably make a soup that would serve at least eight. And if you just cook the lentils up, just to be plain, to be used to make a salad, you can probably get about 12 servings. So whether you use lentils to be a meal extender for mixing with meat, in essence making it a meat extender, or simply just using it to make a meatless meal, you can't beat this for both nutrition and budget friendliness. Meal extender number three, mushrooms. Now, just like with the beans and the lentils, you can use dried mushrooms or you can use canned mushrooms. Now, you might recognize these from my superfood video if you had a chance to watch that. But these are wonderful because not only are they dried mushrooms, they're a mixture of dried mushrooms. And the more variety that we can get when it comes to eating mushrooms, all the better. Because each type of mushroom brings different nutrients to the table, so to speak. But all mushrooms are nutritious, even the simple little button mushrooms that are sold in the can. And mushrooms are really beef's best friend. When you want to limit the amount of meat that you're using, specifically beef, substituting in some mushrooms gives that rich beef taste and texture. For example, if you want to make hamburgers, but you want to use half the amount of ground beef that you would normally use, go ahead and take your mushrooms. If you want, you can whirl them you know, in a blender to where they're really quite pulverized, or you can just take a knife and chop them up real well and mix that in with your ground beef. It gives wonderful flavor, wonderful texture, plus it adds nice moisture to whatever you're making, whether it's a hamburger or a, a, a meatballs or a filling you know, for lasagna or other meat filled, filled dishes. Mushrooms work beautifully with ground beef. Also, if you're making a beef soup, like a vegetable beef soup, and you want to pull back on the amount of little beef cubes that you're using or shredded beef, however you make your beef soup, you'll want to add mushrooms in place of whatever amount of beef you pull back. So if like the chicken soup, you like to use two cups, say, of beef cubes, only use one cup and then use a can of mushrooms. Dried mushrooms and a variety of dried mushrooms work really well in that regard because you get sort of all these different tastes and textures in your soup or in a stew. These work especially well in a stew. If you're making a beef stew and you have sort of nice chunks of beef and then you have nice chunks of mushroom, no one's going to miss the beef if you've pulled back to decrease it by half. They're still going to get that, as they say, that umami, is it umami flavor that meat tends to bring to a meal. They're going to get that flavor from the mushroom and they're still going to have that sort of chewy texture that beef also has. 
So keeping both canned and dried mushrooms in your working pantry and your prepper pantry as a meal extender, specifically a meat extender, can be very helpful. And dried mushrooms rehydrate very quickly. And you can also dehydrate your own mushrooms. So you can buy fresh mushrooms if you grow them or if you get a good buy at the farmer's market on a case of mushrooms. You can dehydrate them and they will rehydrate very quickly. Now, something important to note about mushrooms, whether in the can or dried, is that they're very high in vitamin D and potassium. And these are two nutrients that often our diets are low in. Vitamin D, scientists have found, is linked to lower rates of cancer. So that's something we always wanna make sure that we have plenty of in our diet. And it's always best whenever we can get our vitamins from natural sources like food as opposed to having to take vitamin pills. And the reason is there's a lot of cofactors in food that support vitamins as opposed to just pulling out a specific vitamin and taking it in a pill form. So the more you can eat of whole real foods, the better you are. The better off you are, the better off your health is. Mushrooms are also high in potassium, and that's another nutrient that we are often low on. We have plenty of sodium or salt in our systems most of the time, but sometimes we're low on potassium. So by introducing foods that are rich in potassium, we help balance out our sodium because potassium and sodium work together and like to keep a nice balance in our body. So by pulling back on some of the meat in our recipes and instead replacing that meat with some mushrooms, we're introducing a lot of wonderful nutrients into our meal. And mushrooms are a fraction of the cost of meat, so it's a wonderful meat extender and a meal extender. Meal extender number four, old-fashioned rolled oats. Old-fashioned rolled oats are so versatile and they're so affordable. You can often get a big tub of rolled oats for about $2.50. And if you pay just a little bit more, you can often find it in an organic version. The nice thing about rolled oats is that they're very easy to digest and often they're gluten-free. And the reason I say often gluten-free <laughs> that yes, of course, oats are naturally gluten-free, but if you need something to definitely 100% be guaranteed gluten-free, you wanna make sure that your package of old-fashioned rolled oats says that it's guaranteed gluten-free because it may have been processed in a factory with gluten foods and may have been contaminated slightly with the gluten. So if you need to know that it is guaranteed gluten-free, make sure that your packaging stays that. Well, of course, I think most of us know that old-fashioned rolled oats makes a wonderful breakfast of oatmeal, but the good news is you can do so much with this to extend a meal. You can go ahead and mix this right in with your ground beef. It'll somewhat soften and dissolve as you cook your ground beef. No one's going to notice that there's any oatmeal in there. You can also pulverize this if you have a blender or one of those little spice grinders and make this into a powdered form and use it in that way to mix in meat. That also makes an oat flour and a gluten-free oat flour. And because oats are so reasonable, if you find you wanna preserve your flour, you can always replace a half a cup or a cup of flour with some ground oats. And you don't even have to grind them up if you don't want. You can often just add oats as they are right into your bread recipes. And oats are very versatile. You can use them in sourdough bread recipes, yeast risen bread recipes, as well as quick, quick breads and muffins. You can also use oats in soups and stews. They're wonderful. They add a nice richness, a thickness, and a body to whatever you're serving. There's even a recipe that floats around on the internet and I'll see if I can find it. I've never tried it, but I think this is very clever. People will take old fashioned rolled oats, make patties out of them and fry them up in their frying pan to give the effect of a sausage patty. And people swear that they can't tell the difference. I find that fascinating and that's a very clever way to use rolled oats. Now, when it comes to using old fashioned rolled oats as a meal extender, 
you're actually not just limited to rolled oats. A lot of grains are sold where they've taken the whole grain and they flaked it or rolled it and it looks very similar to rolled oats but it's made from a different grain. And experimenting with other rolled grains is a wonderful way to introduce a various amount of nutrients into your meals because each grain has different vitamins and minerals in it. Now what I've got here are spelt flakes and they look very similar to rolled oats. I'll take out and show you a few here. Very similar. And you can use these in the same way you would use your rolled oats. Now these are generally a little more costly than rolled oats, but still less expensive than meat. And often what I find is this will be sold in the specialty item at my local grocery store, and at least they'll try it out. But sometimes it's not a hit, maybe because people simply don't know how to use it or they're not familiar with it, and then it'll wind up on the clearance aisle. So that's why I always tell you to check the clearance aisle or the clearance end caps that may be at your grocery store. And something that I'll share with you about spelt flakes, if you find these in your travels, is they have a little bit of a richer flavor than rolled oats. So they work really well with meat. And just like rolled oats, you can mix these right in with your ground beef, or you can pulverize them and have this flour that basically now is a spelt flour that you can also use in baking. But they really work nicely with meat because of their slightly stronger flavor that complements the meat beautifully. And I also have over here rye flakes. And these also work very well with meat because they have a little bit more of a stronger flavor than the oats, but yet still a very pleasant flavor. And the color of rye flakes is a little deeper than either of these two, so it also works very well with ground beef. Now, when I get ready to show you the meal that I'm going to cook up with some of these meal extenders that we're talking about today, I will be using some oats. So I'm going to leave these out and we'll come back to those a little later. But how I'm going to use these oats is the same way you could use your spelt flakes or your rye flakes. And keep in mind, this just happens to be what I have. There are a whole host of, as you would say, flakes out there, including ones made from barley. And barley is wonderfully nutritious. And so if in your travels you can find barley flakes, they make a great substitute in place of rolled oatmeal or rolled oats. So be sure to keep your eye open in your specialty grocery aisle. Uh, these things are often tried out at grocery stores. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So sometimes they'll put them on clearance, sometimes they'll put them on sale if they're going to maybe discontinue them. But they're definitely worth adding to your working pantry or your prepper pantry as meal extenders. And both of these can be used to make breakfast as well, make a nice breakfast porridge, not unlike your rolled oats. Spelt is exceptionally nice for that. Now, while we're talking about grains to use as a meal extender, I just want to make a mention about breadcrumbs. Can breadcrumbs be used as a meat extender and also a meal extender? Definitely. And when you may have little bits and bobs of bread that hasn't been eaten, be sure to put that into a plastic bag and save that in your freezer. And over time, when you feel that you've gotten a nice amount of stale bread, you can use that to make breadcrumbs or croutons and then both can be used as meal extenders. And I have videos where I show you how to make different types of homemade breadcrumbs as well as different types of croutons. And I'll be sure to link to those videos for you. Meal extender number five, pasta. When it comes to stretching your food budget, you can never go wrong stocking pasta in your working pantry and your prepper pantry. And pasta is made from durum semolina flour, which is actually very nutritious. And if you cook it to the point of being al dente, which means to the tooth, where it's got some firmness, some bite to it, you don't want to cook it till it's mushy. You want it to keep its firmness. It's very low on the glycemic index, if that's something that you follow for a dietary regime. 
And when something is low on the glycemic index, apparently I understand that it has less impact on your blood sugar. And keeping our blood sugar under control is always a good thing. Now Durham semolina flour contains iron as well as potassium. And we know that potassium in our diets is important. Durham semolina flour also has a whole host of other nutrients in it. Now some of the pastas that work exceptionally well as meal extenders are orzo and couscous. Couscous has become quite common and I think it's very popular. If you're not familiar with orzo, I think you're going to really like it because it actually looks like a grain of rice. And using either couscous or orzo in a soup can really stretch that soup. So you can pull way back on whatever meat you might be adding to your soup and in place of that meat use some, or, use some orzo or some of the couscous and it'll make it rich and thick and really fill out the meal. Well, if you've seen some of my previous videos, I've showed you how reasonable pasta can be. When I did the Walmart haul and other hauls, I showed you that often you can find pasta for 82 cents a box, maybe 92 cents a box, but very frequently no more than 99 cents a box. And I want to give you a little tip about shopping. Now everybody has a different schedule, but what I've found that works very well is I like to go grocery shopping once a week because sales of different items rotate each week. So what's ever on sale one week, I'll buy two or three of those and then next week there'll be different things on sale and I may be buy two or three of those things. So little by little I'm always able to keep the supply in my prepper pantry at a good level. An example of that is one week this pasta was on sale and it was very affordable. I've never tried this brand but it seems like a nice high quality Italian brand uh, so I was happy to be able to purchase that. And yesterday when I was grocery shopping at my local grocery store, I found this pasta and this is a fettuccine and although not an Italian pasta, it is made with Durham semolina flour. And I really couldn't pass this up because this looked like it was one of those pastas that was being discontinued by my grocery store and it was only 40 cents. So I picked up two packages of this for 40 cents for a pound of fettuccine made from beautiful Durham semolina flour. That can't be beat. Now this is a thin spaghetti, which I really like because it cooks a little faster than regular spaghetti. And when you're in a rush, every little minute counts. Now we're also going to use this in the meal that we're going to make when we use our meal extenders. So I'm going to set this aside and we'll come back to it later. So always make sure that you have a good selection of pasta on hand because for the most part it's extremely affordable and it's very filling and it can make an excellent meal extender because you can serve it as a side dish or you can serve it as a main dish. And when serving it as a main dish, you can pull back on whatever meat you might have been serving it with. And pasta works well with so many things, not just meat. Yes, there's meatballs and yes, there's meat sauce, but there's a lot of other things that you can do. For example, in the spring, if you have some capellini, this is a word, they call it angel hair pasta in English. This cooks up basically in two minutes. You can toss this with some canned salmon and some fresh vegetables. It makes a wonderful meal and a wonderfully affordable meal because when you're using the pasta, you're only going to need a small can of salmon. So you're going to be able to stretch that salmon to feed at least four people because you've got the pasta as sort of the background that's going to be very filling and make it look like a hearty meal. And then you put in some vegetables, pick your affordable vegetables, what's ever in season, what's ever a good buy at your grocery store, and you're literally making a beautiful, nutritious, nutrient-dense meal for little money. Meal extender number six, dehydrated potatoes. Now the first thing I want to mention is that you can make this homemade. You don't need to buy these. And if you'd like me to show you how to make dehydrated potatoes, be sure to let me know in the comments below and I'll definitely add that to the list of things to film. But whatever way you keep these in your pantry, they make a wonderful meal extender. 
and they can do so much more than just extend a meal. You can certainly use these to just make mashed potatoes, but there's something else you can do with them that I want to share with you that's a quick tip, it's a little trick, before we talk about how to use these as a meal extender. If you take some of your dehydrated potatoes and mix them with a little water to sort of rehydrate them and then use that water to feed your sourdough starter, you are going to see your sourdough starter really come to life and really bubble up because potatoes are very rich in starch and your yeast loves eating starch. Now, while we're on that topic, I want to mention something that I have over here. This is potato starch. Now, potato starch is different than dehydrated potatoes. Now, if you're a gluten-free baker, you're probably familiar with potato starch and you probably even use it in your baking. However, just like when you rehydrate your dehydrated potatoes into a liquid form and use it to feed your sourdough starter, you can also just use some of your potato starch mixed with your water that you use then to feed your sourdough starter. So any of these to keep on hand if you're a sourdough baker are wonderful. Now dehydrated potatoes make wonderful meal extenders, specifically meat extenders, because they mix beautifully with ground beef. In order to cut back on the amount of ground beef you would use to make hamburgers or meatballs or any type of meat filling for whatever type of recipe you're making, whether it's a lasagna or some type of other casserole, you can take your ground beef, and I say the recipe calls for a pound of ground beef, you can pull that back to a half a pound of ground beef, add about a half to one cup of your dehydrated potatoes, maybe some grated onion to add in a little moisture, and go ahead and use your ground beef that now has been fortified with your meal extender just the same way you would use the whole amount of ground beef. Dehydrated potatoes are very affordable, so it's a very nice savings, especially as we see the price of ground beef skyrocketing. Now, I do want to take a minute to talk about dehydrated potatoes and what to look for when you're shopping for them. Now, this brand I found at Whole Foods, and I wanted to buy this. It was under $3, but over $2, so it was more expensive than what was sold at my grocery store. However, the brand at my grocery store did list dehydrated potatoes first, so that was a good thing. But then it had a whole host of other ingredients, many of which I couldn't pronounce. And that made me feel a little uncomfortable. And the price was not significantly different from this particular brand. So for a few pennies more, to get something that said just dehydrated potatoes was important to me. And that's the same for this Bob's Red Mill brand. This is a lovely uh, dehydrated potato. The potato flakes are just glorious. And again, this is just dehydrated potatoes. Now, I'm not too concerned that these are not organic. Finding dehydrated potatoes or dehydrated potato flakes that are organic can be a little harder just to find in general. And then they may be quite costly. I'm not even really sure, to be honest with you, because I've not seen them. But the fact that both these brands are just dehydrated potatoes makes me feel very comfortable to use them, since they're not also loaded with a lot of chemicals that I can't pronounce. Dehydrated potatoes also make wonderful thickeners. And if potatoes agree with you, this can be a wonderful alternative to using things like cornstarch, especially if corn is a product that doesn't agree with you. Also using dehydrated potatoes, especially if you're making thick soups or creamy soups, allows you to cut back on the amount of cream that you would use. And cream is often more costly than potatoes. So if you have a recipe for a cream soup that calls for using a cup of cream, you could replace that entire cup of cream with a cup of dehydrated potatoes. And that'll definitely lower the cost of making that soup. Or you could even go half and half. You could use half a cup of cream and half a cup of the potatoes. 
Plus, if you need to really stretch your meal, really extend your meal, you can add more of these potatoes and more liquid, whether you're using water or a bone broth. And then you can expand or extend the amount of soup that you have and you're extending that soup for a relatively low cost since dehydrated potatoes are very affordable. Plus, you can also save on some of your flour when you're making bread because in place of some of the flour, you can use some potato flakes, some dehydrated potato flakes. And if you've ever used any type of potato, whether it's potato water or mashed potatoes or these dehydrated potatoes when making bread, even like, as the name implies, potato rolls, you know that potatoes make bread very light and fluffy. So if you're running low on flour or you want to preserve or save some of your flour because maybe it's in short supply or maybe the price is going up, dehydrated potatoes can really come to the rescue. Meal extender number seven, rice. Now I want to mention all of the brands that I've showed you today, and I've showed you a big variety, are all brands that I've purchased. None of this is sponsored. I'm rarely, if ever, brand loyal when it comes to shopping at my grocery store. I find that pretty much when it comes to buying whole real foods, I'm rarely disappointed. I pretty much find one brand relatively equal to another brand. And also at my particular grocery store, I find the store brand to be a very high quality. So it's really just a matter of what I get the best price on or what I have a coupon for or what I see on sale or in the clearance aisle. And speaking of clearance, that's why I have this rice. Now my grocery store used to carry a broad selection of this rice, but it was often very pricey. Here is a similar one, but it's organic. However, the other day when I was shopping, and this is why I say often that I like the idea of shopping weekly, is that this had been moved to the top shelf and the selection had been considerably decreased. They had maybe three or four different types of rice and the price had been dropped dramatically, indicating maybe they just wanted to move it or maybe they're discontinuing carrying it. So I bought a couple of bags. And I always like to keep a lot of rice on hand, both in my working pantry and in my extended pantry. And I'll often take my rice and seal it in mylar bags. And I have a video where I show you how to do that. It's very easy to do and it can really keep your rice fresh and extend it for a long time. But speaking of that, you'll notice both of these are white rice. And that's what I tend to buy as opposed to brown rice because brown rice, although more nutritious, and I do buy some, I use it up quickly when it comes to brown rice because brown rice still has all the bran and germ in place and those contain oil. So the brown rice tends to go rancid faster, much faster than white rice. Now, although white rice has less nutrition than the brown rice, just like so many other things that I've shared with you, I have ways to boost the nutrition. When I make white rice, instead of using water, I often use bone broth and I add butter and I add sea salt. So I'm really adding a lot of nutrition. I'm basically using the white rice as a vehicle to get uh, bone broth and butter and sea salt into my family's diet. Rice is so versatile because not unlike the pastas and some of the other meal extenders we talked about, these can be added to soups and stews and you can decrease the amount of meat that you would otherwise have in your soup or your stew. They can also be wonderful for filling out a casserole where you want to pull back on the more expensive ingredients like beef and chicken. Rice can also be ground up if you have a blender or a little spice grinder and made into a flour, a rice flour. And you can substitute some of the regular flour in a bread recipe and add in the rice flour, which can be very nice because rice does tend to be abundant and you can stock a lot of it and you can keep it fresh for a long time. Whereas flour may have a limited shelf life unless you're using whole grain that you're grinding and sifting and so on and so forth but you can either pull back on the amount of flour you use, especially if you're running low, 
or if there's less at the grocery store, sometimes flour can be difficult to find at the grocery store depending on the circumstances, or maybe the price is rising and the price of rice is lower. So you wanna supplement your baked goods by using a little rice flour and saving or preserving some of your regular flour. Rice, when pulverized, can also make a wonderful breading if you're low on breadcrumbs or if you want to preserve your flour and not use that to fry in, especially if you use mostly whole grain flours, which you really shouldn't be using as a breading and frying because you can cause the oils, the natural oils, in whole grain flour to go rancid and you don't want to do that. The last thing we want to do is introduce rancid foods into our body because that causes inflammation and inflammation leads to disease. So grinding up a little rice, using that to batter dip so to speak, whatever you might want to fry, will make a wonderful light coating and be a very economical way to be breading or deep frying whatever it is that you want to do. Also using cooked rice mixed with chopped meat is a wonderful way to extend the meat that you are using, whatever it is that you're making with that chopped meat. And you can add the rice right into the chopped meat, the cooked rice. It'll often dissolve during the cooking process, or you can even just mash it up a little before adding it into your ground beef. So always making sure that you have plenty of rice in your pantry to use as a meal extender is always gonna come in handy and it's always gonna save you money. Now sort of in this family of rice, you do have other options that are very nutritious and can be used in place of rice. One of those options is barley. And this is a hulled barley, which is the easiest to cook with. This can be used very similar in the way that you might use rice in a soup or a stew. And also like using cooked rice that you mash up a little bit and add into ground beef, you can do the same thing with cooked barley. And if you're looking for a meatless meal to make, you can't go wrong with a barley soup, even a barley mushroom soup. That's gonna be very nutritious and very filling and it's going to give you a nice mouth feel if you add mushrooms and no one's going to miss the beef. So if you like a beef and barley soup, try a mushroom barley soup. I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised at how delicious and how filling it is. Barley is also an excellent source of fiber, something so many of us need more of in our diets. It's also high in niacin, which is one of the B vitamins, and B vitamins are wonderful for nourishing our nervous system. You can also grind up some barley and make a barley flour, and you can use that in your baking if you wanna preserve some of your regular flour. And if you take barley and you want to get like a little fancy and soak it and sprout it, which I teach you uh, in another video how to soak and sprout grains, and then you dry it and then you grind it into a flour, you have what's known as malted barley. It's basically soaked and sprouted barley. And a little bit of malted barley is wonderful to add to breads, whether you're doing a sourdough or a yeasted bread because it really helps with the rise and the texture of making a very nice bread. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a little bit more of a job uh, to soak and sprout it, but it's really, uh, most of the work is on the part of the grain. But that's something to keep in mind when you have barley in your kitchen. And another grain that I want to mention to you, which can be used very similar to rice and barley, is millet. Millet is a wonderful, flavorful grain, and it cooks up very quickly and can be mashed and added into ground beef. It can also be added to soups and stews to give them some body, and it can also be ground into a flour and used in your baking. And it can be especially helpful to gluten-free bakers. And just reading on the back here of the package, you can learn how nutritious millet actually is. It contains calcium, iron, a number of the B vitamins, magnesium, and zinc. So this is a highly nutritious food and definitely worth adding to your working pantry and your prepper pantry for a wonderful meal extender. Now next, I want to share a few bonus items, a few bonus meal extenders with you. And then I want to make a meal for you that's going to use some of our meal extenders. 
Now I want to share two bonus items with you. And the first one is applesauce. Now I think of applesauce as more of a substitution to extend other supplies that you may have in your refrigerator. Now what I've got here are some little cups of applesauce and a nice big jug of applesauce. Both are unsweetened. I also make homemade applesauce and I have a video where I show you how to do that. I'll be sure to link to it. And you can also home can your applesauce. But the reason that I like to keep applesauce on hand is this helps me extend my eggs. Now when you're baking and you need eggs, if you don't want to use up your eggs or even if you're out of eggs, you can use applesauce. Approximately a quarter cup of applesauce can replace one egg in baking. And if you open your applesauce, you can freeze it in quarter cup amounts. And then once they're all frozen, you could do it maybe in ice cube trays, just kind of measuring it out, whatever might equal up to a quarter of a cup, maybe two cubes worth, something like that. Then once they're frozen, you can put them all into a bag, put that in your freezer, and whenever you need an egg substitute for baking, you can pull out a couple of cubes of applesauce. It's also a nice substitution for people who can't eat eggs. Now yes, they make egg replacements for baking and there are other ingredients like flax seeds and a little water and things like that that you can do to use in place of eggs. However, applesauce is really reasonably priced and it makes a very easy, very easy to come by in terms of shopping and finding at your local grocery store to have on hand as an egg replacer. So having some applesauce in your pantry or portioned out and in your freezer to fill in for you when you don't have eggs or you don't want to use up your eggs, but you want to do some baking, you can't go wrong having this on hand. The next bonus item that I want to share with you that makes a wonderful meal extender are canned tomatoes. Now you can have any type of canned tomato on hand. You can even home can your own tomatoes, which I show you how to do in a video where I go through it step by step, perfect for the beginner. And you can water bath canned tomatoes, which makes it very easy to do. Now when it comes to buying canned tomatoes or even a canned tomato sauce, I basically look at price. These were both 88 cents and they're the large cans. So I thought that was a very good buy. Interestingly enough, the whole tomatoes were $1.12 a can, same size can, but they were $1.12 a can. And these are just your standard diced tomatoes. They also had a can, again, the same brand, same size, that was a petite diced tomato, but that was also more than a dollar. So for 88 cents, I was fine with the diced and I was fine with the sauce. Now I make my own homemade tomato sauce and I have a video where I show you how to do that and you can home can it. But I always like to have store-bought canned products as backups in the event that I ever run out of my home canned items. Now this tomato sauce is 29 ounces, that's one pound 13 ounces, and these diced tomatoes are 28 ounces or one pound 12 ounces. For 88 cents, you can't go wrong. And for those of you who have asked me about whether you should buy tomato products in the can or in glass bottles, yes, I always like glass bottles because tomatoes are very acidic and when they're canned in glass, you always feel there'll be very little degradation to either the glass or the tomatoes. However, that said, <laughs> these cans are lined with a non-BPA lining. And so I feel that these are going to last relatively well. And even if you go past their best buy date, chances are they'll still be very nice and fresh and tasty when you open them. Now I'm going to go ahead and put these aside because we're going to use these meal extenders in the meal that we're going to make. And what I've got here is a ground beef that I bought at my local grocery store, HEB. Now I bought a two pack because by buying a two pack, I lowered the price per pack by 50 cents. If I wanted to buy just one pack, it was $6.99. But by buying the two pack, it worked out that each pack was $6.50. 
Also, this is an 85% lean, 15% fat ground beef. And that's generally the mix that I like to buy for two reasons. Number one, I like having the little bit of extra fat in the meat, but also the higher fat content ground beefs tend to be less expensive than the leaner cuts of ground beef or the leaner ground beef. Now the first thing I'm going to do is cut this two pack into half. It's got a nice little score line down here and I'm going to go ahead and put one pack in my freezer. Now this particular ground beef is grass fed and grass finished. And I've talked to you about this once before and many of you in the comments told me you found that discussion fascinating. So in case you're new here or you've not heard about this, I want to share it with you. You'll often see meat sold under the term grass fed. And that means that the cattle were out at pasture and able to eat grass. But sometimes cattle that are even labeled grass fed are not grass finished. Prior to going to the slaughterhouse, they are fed grain to kind of fatten them up a little bit and marble the meat a little nicer, thereby adding more flavor. The drawback with that is that the fat in beef is known as something, and excuse my pronunciation, I believe it's like conjugated linolenic or linolenic acid, and that CLA is very nutritious. Whereas when you add grain to the cattle's diet, it lowers the level of CLA, making their fat less nutritious. So whenever you can find any beef that's labeled grass-fed and finished, that's a very good thing because the level of the CLA has been kept high. Now the regular ground beef at my grocery store that was labeled natural, and it simply said that the cattle hadn't, give, hadn't been given antibiotics or hormones, but there was no mention of what the cattle had been fed, was $5.99 a pound. So for about 50 cents more a pound, I felt getting the grass fed and grass finished was a very nice option for 50 cents more. Now, this does not imply that it's organic, but chances are when cattle are raised on grass, they're just generally healthier. And even though technically not organic, I always like to choose grass-fed and grass-finished beef over other options. Also, the organic ground beef is generally more expensive. And as a matter of fact, one of the ones I was looking at my, looking at, at my grocery store was $19.99 a pound. That's just way out of my budget. Now we're not going to use this entire pound of ground beef to make our recipe. We're actually going to use half and then we're going to use a meal extender. So I'm bringing the price of using ground beef in my recipe from $6.50 down to $3.25. So I'm going to go ahead and open this package of ground beef and I'm going to cut it in half and I'm going to store the other half in my freezer. This ground beef was bought yesterday fresh, so it's never been frozen. So I'm fine uh, opening this cutting it in half and putting the other half well wrapped into my freezer. Now I'm just going to eyeball this and cut it in what I think looks like about half. Well I've got that cut in half and now I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this half in some nice plastic wrap. This is for those of you who have seen me uh, use this in the past and you've asked me what this is because it doesn't look like a clear plastic wrap. It is a plastic wrap. It's just that I think it's the, called the Glad Press and Seal. It works quite well and it doesn't tend to get like all, it's all like, I think the only word I can think of is cattywampus whenever I try to use other plastic wraps. They all wind up sticking to themselves and whatnot. So this, this works pretty well. And it's not sponsored, it's just something I buy. <laughs> but in any event, then I'm going to, after I've wrapped this well in the plastic wrap, I'm going to go ahead and put this in a freezer-proof bag. And then I'm just going to press out some of the air and finish sealing the bag. If you've got one of those um, uh, food saver sealers, you can certainly do that. That would be wonderful. And I'm going to go ahead and pop this into my freezer and it'll be ready for another meal.
Now I've got my half a pound of ground beef in a bowl and to that I'm going to add one cup of rolled oats, old-fashioned rolled oats. Now the old-fashioned rolled oats that I bought were approximately six cents an ounce and a cup of rolled oats weighs approximately three ounces. So this cup of rolled oats is about 18 cents. So for under 20 cents, that's quite a good meal extender. Now you can go ahead and add these directly into your ground beef. They usually dissolve and soften somewhat when they're cooking in the ground beef, but you could also add a little water to them before you add them into your ground beef. You could also add, which adds actually a very nice flavor and moisture, a little bit of grated onion, and then mix them in, and this all will help soften them and allow them to really cook and almost like melt into the meat. But I like to go one step further and take my rolled oats and just whirl them in one of these little spice or coffee grinders. And this basically turns them into an oat flour. And that mixes beautifully with pretty much anything you want to use old-fashioned rolled oats in. Now I want to mention, so many of you have asked me where I bought this whenever I bring out my little spice grinder. And this is a KitchenAid. I don't, I've had this a long time, so I don't know if this model is available any longer, but in the description below, I will put the model number. So maybe you can look for it and find it in your travels and I'll also see if I can find something similar. And if so, I'll put a link to it in the description. So here we go. We just press this down and this will grind it up literally almost within seconds into a flour. Now that I've got my old-fashioned rolled oats all ground up into a lovely flour, I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle this right on top of my ground beef. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in a little salt and pepper and a little Italian seasoning. And the cost of these are basically negligible. So I'm just going to eyeball this basically about a teaspoon of salt. And this is a nice sea salt. It's a fine ground sea salt. Then I'll go ahead and add in a little black pepper, a nice fresh ground black pepper. Over here I've got some Italian seasoning, and this is also something fun that I recently found in my travels. It's a mixture of Italian herbs, and it's also in a grinder format. Now I also like to make Italian seasoning homemade, as well as a whole host of other seasonings, and I have a video where I show you how to make all those seasoning blends that I enjoy having on hand. But just like having store-bought canned tomatoes in addition to my home canned tomatoes, I also like to buy uh, store-bought spices and herbs and whatnot. Whenever I find a good buy or something clever like this that grinds them fresh, I thought this was really wonderful. So let me go ahead and add in some nice Italian seasoning. And I really just eyeball this. I'm probably adding in somewhere about a teaspoon. Now at this point, if you wanted, if you had like a little bit of leftover hard cheese, maybe if you had a little piece of Parmigiano Reggiano, even if you just have saved the rind, you can grate that and add that in here for extra flavor. Also, if after we mix this, if we feel the meat feels a little dry, I think it's going to be fine because we do have the 85-15 mix, so we have a good amount of fat in here. But if you were using the leaner cut, uh, a little grated onion would do wonders, a little splash of water, a little splash of milk, of cream, anything like that, just to help moisten things up a bit if you feel your lower fat meats seem a little dry. Now, as you saw, I just added salt and pepper and a little Italian seasoning to this ground beef. You could also add onion powder or garlic powder. Really, any spices or seasonings that you like will be fine. Now, I'm going to mix this all together, and at this point, you could shape them into hamburgers, or you could cook them up in your frying pan and have a cooked ground beef that you then put into a lasagna or some other type of casserole. But what we're going to do today, based on the seasonings that I've put in here, is we're going to make meatballs. So I'm just going to start mixing this all up, and when it's done, I'll show you how we shape these into meatballs and cook them up. 
although traditionally you'll often see recipes call for adding breadcrumbs or maybe bread soaked in milk, uh, two ground beef to make meatballs, the nice thing about adding oatmeal is that you're adding nutrition, extra nutrition, as opposed to that which you would be adding with simply breadcrumbs. Oatmeal is mild in flavor and mild in color, not looking unlike as though you had used breadcrumbs. But instead of just plain breadcrumbs, you're getting some wonderful fiber as well as other vitamins and minerals. Now, when I go ahead and make the meatballs, I like to keep a little bowl of water handy because I'm going to wet my fingertips as I shape the meatballs. Then I'm going to go ahead and cook them up in my frying pan. If you don't want to babysit them in the frying pan, you can certainly put them on a baking sheet and bake them in your oven at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And while those meatballs are cooking, we're going to talk about making a sauce and we're going to talk about boiling up our spaghetti. And then we'll have a delicious meal of spaghetti and meatballs for just around $5 and it'll be enough to feed a crowd. And we'll slice open the meatballs and see exactly how they came out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ground beef and I'm going to try to divide this up into approximately 12 equal pieces. I want to get as many meatballs out of this half a pound of ground beef as I can. Well, I divided my mixture of ground beef in half and then I took that half and started shaping what I felt were a good size meatball. They're not going to be huge and humongous, but they'll be plenty to spread around. And I think that I may even be able to get eight uh, meatballs out of each half of this piece of ground beef. So that would be a total of 16 meatballs, which would be fantastic. So I'm just going to go ahead and wet my fingers here and just kind of shape this into a ball, roll it in the palm of my hand, and now we have a nice little meatball. Now that little bit of water on my fingertips just helps keep everything together and add just a scotch of moisture, but not too much. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn my burner to about a medium heat. I'm not going to put any fat into my frying pan because I do have that 15% of beef fat in this ground beef. If you're using an exceptionally lean ground beef, you can always just put in a little splash of olive oil. And I also tend to get a lot of questions about this countertop burner that I have. This is a Cuisinart, Cuisinart countertop burner. And again, I'll put the model number in the description below, so maybe you can search for that. And if I can find it online, I'll definitely put a link for it. I like it very much. It's been very reliable and very helpful to me, especially when I do home canning. Uh, but the one thing that I do want to mention, if you buy this, it tends to run a little hot. So don't rush right away to put it on five. I always like to start around three, a real mid-range, and then watch it closely. Once this heats up, I'll start adding in my meatballs. Now I've made all my meatballs and I have 16 of them, which is great. Now, if you're Italian or of Italian descent like me, I know you may be saying, oh, the meatballs are a little small, but don't worry because we're going to fill this meal out with some nice pasta and a good hearty sauce. And keep in mind, we're trying to stretch our budgets, stretch our food budgets and make the most of the food we have. So sometimes that means making things in smaller portions as prices rise. You can also round out this meal with some homemade bread. I have a lot of recipes for how to make homemade bread, some of which have over a million views. So they're very popular, very easy to make, and I'll be sure to link to those. And you could also serve this with a side of fermented or pickled giardiniera. That's a mixture of Italian vegetables that have been fermented all the better uh, because that makes them very rich in probiotics and good for our digestion. But you can also pickle them. And you can literally do this sometimes with just vegetable scraps and that's going to cost you next to nothing to make. So overall it's going to be a very, very reasonable meal. Yet a nutritious and nutrient dense meal. And even though you've mixed your ground beef with oatmeal, we've got some wonderful herbs and spices in there. So I'm confident they're going to be delicious. So this is going to be a delicious and nutritious meal. Well, my pan has heated up nicely. So I'm going to go ahead and start putting my meatballs in here. And then I'm going to go ahead and boil my water and cook up my pasta. And then I'll show you how we're going to do our sauce. 
Now let's talk about this sauce. This is a full-fledged spaghetti sauce. Not only does it have tomatoes in here, obviously, but it's loaded with all types of herbs and spices, including dehydrated onions and dehydrated garlic. So you can just go ahead and use this as is. If you want to spend a little more money, because as I said, this can was 88 cents along with this can being 88 cents, you can go ahead and add in the diced tomatoes to this sauce to just make it a little chunkier, a little richer, more like a homemade marinara. But if you just use this sauce, you're going to be closer to making this whole meal for about $5. If you want to go ahead and add in your diced tomatoes, it's just going to push it up a little higher, a little closer to $6. But we'll go ahead and splurge today and we'll add in the diced tomatoes and we'll get a nice chunky tomato sauce. Now, if you get a good buy on canned whole tomatoes, you can easily whirl those in your blender and make your tomato sauce homemade. All you need to do is add some herbs and spices, a little salt and pepper, uh, a little garlic, a little onion, whatever you like and you can make your own homemade tomato sauce from whole canned tomatoes. And then when I make spaghetti and meatballs, I'll give you a little tip. I like to go ahead and with whatever sauce that I'm using, whether it's homemade or something like this, once my meatballs are cooked, I'm gonna go ahead and add the sauce into the meatballs in the frying pan. And that's going to give the sauce a really nice, rich flavor because it's going to pick up some of the fond the, from the bottom of the frying pan, from the meatballs cooking, and a little bit of the umami flavor from the meat. And so I highly recommend doing that to add a little level of richness to a very simple meal like this. Now my meatballs have cooked up beautifully. So now I'm gonna go ahead and add in my sauce and let them just simmer. Oh, listen to that. Let them just simmer in the sauce a little bit. Now I'm just gonna use my spatula to get every little last bit of goodness out of my can. You could certainly swirl this with a little water. I don't like to dilute the sauce any, so that's why I'm just using the spatula. Now these diced tomatoes have a lot of liquid in this can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take a mesh strainer over a bowl and I'm going to drain out this liquid. Now the reason I'm straining the liquid off of these diced tomatoes is because I don't want to add this into my sauce to dilute it. But I do want all the beautiful diced tomatoes that are in this can to fill out and kind of bulk up my sauce. Now I'm not going to throw out this juice. I'm going to save this in my refrigerator or in my freezer and I'm going to use this as the base to maybe start another tomato sauce or use it as the base of a soup or a stew or for flavoring anything. I could use it to mix with some water and then cook the rice or cook white rice in it to start a nice Spanish style rice. One thing I want to share with you is that as we work toward becoming more and more modern pioneers in the kitchen, is that we always have to be looking to what our ancestors did. And they never wasted anything. Food was often in a short supply, and they often had large families to feed. So they made use of everything. And that's what we need to learn to do as well. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put these right into my sauce along with the meatballs. Now I'm just gonna stir this around really nicely to get those diced tomatoes spread out through the sauce along with the meatballs. And then I'm just gonna let this simmer a little while we cook our pasta. Well, this just looks lovely and it smells fantastic. And I love the way the diced tomatoes really help fill out the sauce. Now I'm going to go ahead and add this little bit of tomato juice to a jar and pop it in my fridge and it'll be ready to use for another meal, a wonderful meal extender. Now let's talk about cooking the pasta. Now, as I said, I'm using a thin spaghetti. I like this. It cooks a little quicker than regular spaghetti. And I just, I like the texture. I have always enjoyed thin spaghetti. Now, how you want to cook this al dente is you want to look at the directions and you want to see how long they recommend cooking the pasta. And most will be recommending it to a time that will cook it al dente. But of course, 
everybody's stove is different, the water is different, everything's different. So I always recommend that first you look at the time that they recommend. And here they recommend seven to nine minutes. What I'll do is set my timer for six minutes and I'll check my pasta at six minutes. That's exactly what I did when I cooked up this today. At six minutes, it wasn't quite yet cooked, so I let it go another minute and after seven minutes, it was perfectly al dente. It had a beautiful texture to it. It had a little bit of a bite, a little bit of firmness to it, and it was nowhere near mushy. So I knew it was perfectly al dente. Now let's take a minute to talk about the pasta water, the water that you cooked your pasta in. And the same rule applies to water that you would cook your potatoes in or even other vegetables in. Remember when I mentioned about being a modern pioneer in the kitchen and wasting nothing? Well, I don't want you to waste your pasta water and I don't want you to waste your potato water. Pasta water and potato water are wonderful for feeding your sourdough starter. But they can also be used as a base for soups and stews and in place of any water or milk you might use to make bread, anything like that. There's nutrition in here and there is something from the starch that adds body to wherever you use this. That's why often if you make a pasta dish that involves some cheese or some cream, they'll often tell you to set some of the pasta water aside because the starch in it that you might pour into your pasta along with the cheeses or the cream that you're using helps thicken it, helps make it a little richer. So never throw out your pasta water. Save it in your refrigerator for a few days if you think you're gonna use it up in a few, few days or freeze it and freeze it in amounts that you think you might need it. You could freeze it in ice cube trays, you could <laughs> freeze it in little uh, plastic cup sizes, in whatever way you think you might use it, but don't throw it out. And the same goes for water in which you might boil vegetables. Vegetables are rich in vitamins and minerals, and so is the water in which they're cooked in. You can save that and water your plants with it. You can also use that as a base for soups and stews. You can also use that to add to your sourdough starter in that it does have some natural sugars in it that the yeast will enjoy eating. It also makes a simple mineral broth a mineral broth that you can use as a sipping broth, not unlike you would use bone broth. And you can also use that mineral rich vegetable broth in place of wherever you would use water when cooking grains. So as you can see, never waste anything, find clever ways to use everything, and that is going to stretch your grocery budget, and it's also gonna always be bringing more and more nutrition to whatever meals you make using those little meal extenders. Well, I've got a nice big pasta bowl here. And what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of my sauce without any meatballs in it. And I'm just gonna put that down in the bottom of my bowl. And then I'm gonna put my pasta on top of that and just toss it with a little bit of the sauce. Now I put my pasta into my bowl on top of that little bit of sauce. And I'm just gonna turn it around so that I get that sauce distributed throughout. And this just helps the pasta not to stick together. Now that I've got a little bit of that sauce tossed in with the pasta, I'm gonna go ahead and put the rest of this sauce right on top. Look at this magnificent meal. You bring this to the table, nobody's going home hungry. And there's only a half a pound of ground beef in here. You serve this with some homemade bread, maybe some fermented Italian vegetables, and it's a feast. Now, if you wanted and you had a little nub maybe of some hard cheese like Parmigiano Reggiano, you could grate a little bit of that on top. You could put some of the dried Italian seasoning on top. You could put some uh, parsley, especially if you grow some in your garden or in one of these cans, some flat leaf Italian parsley. You could chop a little bit of that to give it a little perk of color. There's a lot that you can do for very little cost. Alrighty, well now we need to do the piste de resistance here <laughs> and give these meatballs a taste. Well, let's give these a taste. Get a little bit of that sauce on there. Mmm. Mmm. These are delicious. You would never miss the meat you're never gonna know that there's oatmeal in here. And what a wonderful way 
to extend the chopped meat that you're using or ground beef that you're using to make meatballs. I highly recommend doing this. Now, if you'd like more information on how to stock your prepper pantry with real food on a budget and how to store it properly to extend its life, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a full playlist on how to do all these things with the prepper pantry and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.